world has changed. America has changed. If something were to happen tomorrow... How self-sufficient would you be? Could you grow your own food? Could you sustain your own livestock? Could you survive? This is the We Grow Our Show with Nick and Don. Nick and Don talk about everything from politics to planting. They cover techniques, methods, and tips on how to not only survive, but thrive. Visit the website at WeGrowHours.com. Lock and load. This is the We Grow Our Show. Get your grow on. Welcome back to the We Grow Our Show. We've got Lieutenant Laryngitis over here just hacking up crap in his lungs. So I'm trying not to. Hopefully his editing's not too bad. Yeah. You should see the, the, the pop filter. It's got dangly parts. It does not. <laughs> just one. <laughs> oh, gross. I think I got him sick from my, from my trek through the giant petri dish known as Disneyland. What do you uh, call that disease again? Uh, hephaserphalades. That's it. <laughs> Something like that. This <laughs> is so gross. You gotta, anyway. Never mind. Okay, come you on. There's Ebola in there somewhere too. Ebola? Have a sir Ebola <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh man. I was reading this list of all of the things that we've been scared of over the last 10 years. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Like ISIS and. Yeah, it's a big. Hold on. I gotta bring it up. All right. I gotta bring it. Here it is. All right, so starting back in – stop it. Is this like what news story bumped what news story? It says, people in 2000, Y2K is going to kill us all. 2001, Anthrax is going to kill us all. 2003, West Nile. Four, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, no, three. That was three. Four was SARS. Five, bird flu. Six, E. coli. Uh, seven, vaccines. Uh, eight, the bad economy. Swine flu. BP oil spill in 2010. 2011 Obamacare, which we're still – never mind. Uh, 2012, the end of the world according to the Mayans. 2013, North Korea. And now in 2014, Ebola. Yeah, but you forgot the only thing that may actually kill us all. What's that? Fukushima. Fukushima. <laughs> I don't know if there was one Japanese guy that spoke English that just knew this was going to end poorly and named that place <laughs> Fukushima. There, it reminds <laughs> me of the plane when th- there was a – plane that crashed and some reporter got a call with uh-huh. the name of the pilots. Oh, no. Do you no. remember that? Oh, I can't, no. I don't was... remember all the names, but like, you know, it was like Me Too Low. <laughs> <laughs> Me Too Low. <laughs> it was like a co-pilot and they went through this list and they played it live like on the freaking TV and I, you know, it was, everybody's jaw kind of dropped. I want to pull and that off. I'll see if I can find that and just put that news story in the show notes. It's a little <laughs> video. See if anybody was it remembers like, that. Uh, pull loop now. Yeah, and we too low. <laughs> and we too low. <laughs> I think I do remember that. Yeah, and we go boom. <laughs> we go boom. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'll see if I can find that video. That's, oh, that's gosh. terrible to make fun of. But. It it is, but at the same time, if you're not laughing about what you're going through, life isn't worth living. Yeah. You yeah. gotta, you gotta at least laugh it off a little bit. I'm trying, but I keep hacking up that lung from that hepaserfal AIDS thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're gonna need a shot of penicillin. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, it's been a week now, you guys listening to it, uh, since we went to Prepper Fest. Yeah. But, uh, pretty good showing there. It was cool seeing you guys. Yeah, we got to see a lot of neat people and it was fu- My favorite part was that there were some people that came up that had never gotten involved in it. this is their first prepper event uh-huh. and their first time even thinking about becoming involved in growing their own foods, supplying their own livestock, you know, anything like that. And it was cool because we got to say, Hey, if you need some help, we've got almost 40 episodes that you can go listen to and yeah. you, you might find something. I was like pretty proud of that. That was Ooh. cool. Is I mean, we've got a, we've got a library of stuff that they can go to Yeah, and you can treat each one like a class. Yeah, and go back too. You know, if we'd love for you guys to share out a little bit, <laughs> you know, if you skip want. The, skip the first one though. I listened to that again. Well, I think the second one was the one that you should skip. 
What, what I mean, was he it? was really good, the guest, but I was really bad at editing, and oh. he sounded like he was on like this. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, a CB radio of some sort. I did a horrible job. Well, I, I, the first time that uh, the the first episode, it sounded like I was making late night phone calls to girls that I liked, <sighs> <laughs> trying to be quiet. It's just. <laughs> Ubery uh, gooberness. It's been a fun journey oh. and we're glad you came along. Oh. So this week we've got, uh, Anne, who is a farm girl in the making. A farm girl in the making. I love that title too. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. My mom is a fan of hers and that's how I found out about her. Yeah. I think the only reason Don agreed to the interview is so that his mother didn't beat him when he went home. No, it's You still living she... at mom's house in the basement there? <laughs> how did you know? Well, I don't know. There's just the Dungeons and Dragons, uh, <laughs> Craigslist ad you put out last week. No, wait, talking about Dungeons and Dragons. We had a girl come visit last week and you were all excited like a Dungeons and Dragons party. So I know you know what that is. I saw I've that never Facebook played the comment. game. <laughs> uh, um, no, she's, it's kind of neat because uh, Anne blogs about kind of her transition into this, which started not too long ago. So we're going to find out uh, about canning. Which is kind of the reason I wanted to have her on because she made this post about rebel canning. So yeah, I was like, "Ooh, a re- what is a rebel can?" I had to seriously. Know. It's like rebel canning. Is there really? Uh, what do you? Uh, oh no, I, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, know. You, I have no idea. How do you break the rules of canning? You just heat it up, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. We Your really wife cans. I don't. I never pay attention to my wife. I mean, that's. <laughs> Oh, this, this is that, the one episode she'll listen to now. This is awful. Yeah. yeah. No, well, we'll ask Ann about it. Um, I, I honestly don't know the first thing about canning. So this should be good. And how I can be a rebel. I know. Yes. Anything that I can be a rebel. Anarchy. Yeah. So, or a renegade. 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 Yeah. Anyway, you want to mention that you're going to start selling maybe some more rabbits uh, here as a renegade? Well, if I put it on the air, then I'll have to do it. I know. That was kind of the point. <laughs> All right. We're starting up Renegade Rodent. So as a feeler, as a feeler, if you hear this part of the show, go to facebook.com backslash Renegade Rodent. Oh, you already have the Facebook up? Yeah. There's a Facebook page up. I didn't even know that. You liked it. Oh. You're okay. an admin on it. Oh, cool. Yes. <laughs> I thought that was on Hostile Power. No, I'm not an admin on that one. No, you're not. I, uh, I do remember that. So cool. Renegade Rodin, that's R-E-N-E, Renegade. <laughs> well, I put A at I first. I spell good. <laughs> I don't read so good. <laughs> Shut up, Don. You don't know. No, nope, I there. don't. I don't have a clue. Anyways, go to, go to, Re- just look up Renegade Rodin. It's, it's two, uh, it's a rat and a rabbit on motorcycles. So they look pretty awesome. Yeah. Anyway, so this will be a test to see if you guys actually get to that page. Is that what it is? No, yeah, it I'm not. Test. I'm not trying to promote it yet because I don't even know what they're buying. Well, what we're selling, yeah, is going to be uh, bunny popsicles. Yeah, bunny popsicles for <laughs> livestock. That's right. For big like snakes. And That's not livestock. And <laughs> I, I was going to keep going livestock. on. They're not livestock. I guess not. <laughs> Wild animals. I don't know. What, what are they considered? Pets? I mean, a lion is not a pet, so I can't say that. Well, it'll be, you know, servicing people like uh, Mike Tyson that has a tiger <laughs> in his house. It's a limited uh, target audience. You know, we ought to say, Mike, if you come on the podcast. We will uh, hook you up with a year's supply with of rabbits. some rabbits. Yeah. I wonder if he'll listen. Oh man, wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we're starting up Renegade Rodent, which is, uh, eventually will be a direct to consumer, uh, monitor and snake feed business. Right. As well as small lizards will have a division of, of black soldier flies and, and things like that. So that's what we're starting up on the side. Not to bombard you guys, but if there's any creepy snake people out there, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well, uh, let's, uh, let's have Ann on. Sounds good. What will you do when your stored supplies run out? Are you prepared? Hostile Hair provides equipment and education you need to control your own infinite food supply. We have live food storage systems for rabbits, quail, and other urban livestock for any situation and strategy. Don't be limited by what's on the shelves. Get started with an infinite food source today. Get prepped. Stay fed with Hostile Hair. Call 480 331 
888-345-3761 or visit HostelHair.com. Welcome back to the We Grow Our Show. We've got an awesome guest with us. Unfortunately, not in studio. Uh, we've got Anne with A Farm Girl in the Making. Anne, how are you doing today? Good, thank you. So this is an interesting story. We were talking a little bit off the off the air uh, about uh, some projects that are coming up. Sounds like you've really hit a, a home run with this. <laughs> it, it's it's pretty cool when 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 you get something going and there's a lot of people that like it, a lot of energy along with it. So let, let's hear how you got this thing started. Um, actually, we were uh, we had a separate property. It was about five acres. We had um, been working that property, and my husband and I. It was a little further away than we really wanted to from our family. And uh, we were right in the middle of selling it. And uh, we ended up, um, I just sat up one night at 11 o'clock at night, and I decided that I was going to document our lives. So the the Facebook page initially was just about documenting what we were doing. And that was it. And then before I knew it, it just <laughs> it started snowballing from there. And um, we, were, um, we were able to be shared by a bunch of big pages. Um, who believed in what we were doing. And from there, in less than a year, we've hit 7,000 fans on Facebook. Huh. Um, with those fans, we um, they've asked us to start a website, which we have, and we'll be launching that actually on our anniversary date of November the 2nd. Um, we branched out to Instagram and to Twitter, um, Google+. Plus. So it's um, it's a lot in a year, and I'm still overwhelmed by it, but um, <laughs> that's basically how I got started. Your your website, what um what is the website gonna be when on uh, November second? It's on um, the uh the site is a farm girl in the making dot com. Okay. And what it's actually designed for is a library. I do a lot through Facebook because that seems to be where everybody is right now. And it just was supposed to be a reference site for people to be able to go back and find tips on how to take care of your flocks, your goats, canning, gardening, um, and just follow our journey. But we could not um we couldn't store everything on Facebook, so the library switched over to the dot com site. Okay, very cool. So I got to tell you, my mother um, has her own blog, uh, Feathers and Veggies. I think the name of it is, because <laughs> she does chickens and she loves her little silkies and her chickens. And she started about a year ago as well with the ch- whole chicken raising thing. And she's just a crazy chicken lady now. I mean, she's got the <laughs> signs up and everything. So, uh, <laughs> loves her chickens. But I had been mentioning that I wanted to have somebody on to tell us about canning. And you had made a post the other day about rebel canning. And my mom sent me, oh my gosh, you got to see this. You got to see this. This is a perfect reason for you to have Anna on. <laughs> so I said, okay, mom, I'll, I'll invite her on for this. So, um, tell us about your canning experience, and then let's get into what even Rebel Canning is. Well, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but in the canning world, there are groups of individuals who believe in canning in certain different methods. Um, you have um, specific canners that will follow only USDA, FDA regulations and recipes. Um, you have canners that follow traditional values of, my grandmother did it this way, so I'm going to do it this way. They usually don't use a pressure canner. They will hard boil everything for hours in order to actually um, can something and preserve it. And then you have basically what I will label myself as, which is um, a fence sitter. I follow USDA, FDA regulations and recipes. I also can in regards to traditional values and methods. Um, I do a lot of research in my canning. I do... um, I just feel that in each person's home, they have to do what's best for what they want to do for their family in order to preserve food. And um, sometimes it calls for a pressure canner, and to me, sometimes it calls for just a hard water boil. I can think that the um, the the, I can think that individuals don't normally would can. For example, a lot of people won't can butter. I do preserve butter. Um, I do make ghee. I do. I do canned pumpkin butter, you know, some things that the the USDA and FDA don't approve of because they deem it as being unsafe. Okay. So I know Nick is a, his wife does canning, so he's a little familiar Uh with canning. However, I'm a total, total noob when it comes to canning. (laughs) Noob. So explain to me the, like, I know what a pressure cooker is and I know that Uh when you can something, you take it, 
and you throw it in a jar and you put it in some boiling water and you seal a lid and you wait 10 minutes or so and then you unseal it and you put it in your cabinet. So go through what canning is because in my eyes, that's all I know. So what are the differences well, between these? Okay, so there's, there's definitely different tools that you can use for canning. Pressure canning is something that is a low acidic item. For example, meat, green beans, carrots. Um, those items are uh, potatoes. Those are all low acidic items. Those items you would realistically, in order to kill the botulism that you're that is in the food, you would have to pressure can that um, to make soups. To can, I'm sorry, to can soups and stews, meat, fish, you pressure can it. Um, if you wanted to make, for example, jellies, salsa, um, verde, um, gosh, and jams, you know. Uh, so pickled items, you would use a hot water can, which would actually what you're referring to as you put it in a water, it covers by an inch, it boils for up to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 20 minutes. And then um, a method that really blew up on my page that had a couple people in an uproar, um, I also use a steam canner. Oh, very cool. A steam, steam canner. canner? Yeah, so it's called a, it's a steam canner. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so a steam canner is um, you, it minimizes the amount of heat that um, you're actually putting into your house. So you, you are steaming your food in order to preserve it and seal the jars versus putting it in a hard water boil. So anything that you can basically hard water boil, you should be able to steam can. That process, that tool has not been approved by the USDA FDA because they had not allowed enough time of research in order to give it a stamp of approval. But, however, you can buy steam canners in just about any store that sells a pressure canner and a hot water canner. It just hasn't been government approved yet. Well, that's okay. I'm um, pretty sure that most of what I am is unapproved by the government. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, every, <laughs> every drug that has ever killed people and got reclaimed by the FDA was first <laughs> approved by the FDA. So – Whatever. <laughs> I say if it yeah, works, so, it works. And, so, and that's what happens is that the world of canning is divided, okay? And so you have specific individuals that it's a nasty world. I'm not going to lie. It's a great, it's a great, wow. great procedure. And what you're learning in regards to how to preserve for your family and how to care for your family, but it's a nasty world. You have. So um, there's like these Hatfields and McCoys of ladies canning. This is oh, so it's, it's awesome. yeah, it's I know, pretty bad. It's a whole new world. <laughs> I, I, I would I, never I, guess I, I, that. Any canner that's going to hear this is probably going to flinch for me being as blunt as I am about it, but it is. <laughs> when you follow canning pages, they're, they're, they're hardcore. Either you follow the US, USDA or SDA or you don't. And there are arguments and fights nonstop about, you know, being accusatory of trying to harm your family or why you would do it. And, <laughs> So, it, so canning is not something that, you know, you put out there. But honestly, for my Facebook page, I am very, very, very direct and blunt in saying, you know, I will tell them this is not a USDA, FDA approved recipe, or it's not an approved canning method. Make a choice for your family. And if you feel it's a good choice, go ahead and do it. If not, ask me and I'll tell you the correct procedure for government approval. So you, you know, are a true so I, I make it. I, I am. I am a true. I, I would say that to a degree. Yes, I would. You know, I, I, I'm very careful in my meat. Definitely. I'm very careful in low acidic vegetables and fruits. Um, you know, but butter, it can go rancid. It's a chance that I take, but when you open a jar of butter that's gone rancid, you know instantly that it's not preserved. You know, so I, I do a lot of it, research. Right? Of course. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I do a lot of research. You know, I, I, any new recipe that I do, I, I go back, I look it up, I see what's good or what's bad about it, and then I weigh out the decision right then and there. Very and cool. And that's, that's pretty much how I do it. Okay, so uh, I, you've opened my eyes to a whole new world of canning I didn't know existed. <laughs> but yeah, I, what what is kind of the – I guess we should say probably you shouldn't if you've never canned, like me, I shouldn't go out and can some meats and use a, a, a rebel canning recipe. Um, but what is the danger in doing it wrong? Because I would think as soon as you open that jar, you would know, like you said, whether it's rancid or not. Well, sometimes. Botulism has no scent. 
Okay, there's no scent in it, there's no odor in it, there's no visual aspect that something is growing in there for botulism. Um, an easy way to determine if a jar has gone good or bad, of course, is you know, there's an old canning rule that says, if in doubt, throw it out. So you open up the jar, you see something black in there, obviously it's mold, discard your jar, okay? But when you start messing with um, low acidic foods and meats and fish, you know, those are the things that I don't take a chance on. I really don't. I I I make sure that I pressure can it, the botulism. Like I said, you, you don't know what it is. But if you look at the statistics in regards to how many cases of individuals died by botulism in the last 10 years, you, of course, you know, have more people dying of other incidences before botulism. Right. And... Yeah. um. So it's a chance. It's a gamble, basically. So I, I feel a little bit dumb because I've, I've heard the word botulism, but never before has it occurred to me to look it up and know what people are talking about. I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm going to go play video games. <laughs> I'll play with my rabbits. I don't know. So what is botulism exactly? Botulism is a bacteria that grows in um, food items and can be killed at high levels of heat. Okay. So – when you can something, right, and you, you're making something, if you're raw packing, for example, that means to pack a jar with um, raw meat, and you are either going to just can it based on that and allow it to create its own juices, the, the ger- I guess the easiest way to say it, the germs that are in that, mm-hmm. if not killed properly, continue to grow, causing a bacteria that's in the food items. Okay. Does so that make it, sense? it could be different strands of bacteria then. Not just then, one but it, that's it, called yes, botulism. But, it, but it's all it's botulism as a whole. Yes. Okay. It's like a, a horrible case of food poisoning. Oh. That, that's what you could equate it to, a horrible case of food poisoning that can actually kill you. So what kind of temperatures do you need to hit in order to get rid of all of that uh, that bacteria? For the pressure canner, you know, I don't know that answer off the top of my head. That would be one of the things that I go back through in my manual. <laughs> <laughs> but at, so at, at, the, at 212, at, at Fahrenheit, 212 well, Fahrenheit, you should be able to kill everything though, right? But You should be able to, but it has to, so when you, yeah, so if you're looking at your pressure canner, right, depends on the type of pressure canner you have. I have a, a dial gauge one, okay. meaning that, for example, if I'm going to do, okay, let's just say um, red meat. I'm canning red meat to put up. I know that I need to at least pressure can it for 90 minutes. And in that 90 minutes, it has to hit, um, I think that's, I would, I, I want to say 11 pounds of pressure. And I think I'm pretty accurate on that. 11 pounds of pressure for 90 minutes for my altitude. Okay. So my altitude says 11 pounds of pressure in 90 minutes. Now, if it flexes below that 11 pounds of pressure, my timing has to start all over again. Really? So not one time can it drop in that 90 minutes below 11 pounds of pressure. It has to maintain a steady flow of 11 pounds of pressure or slightly bit higher in order to successfully kill any form of botulism in your jars. Interesting. So the pressure is what's killing it, not so much the temperature. No, the temperature. The pressure and the steam. Yep. Yeah, pressure yeah. and the steam because it's full of steam. Yeah. Pressure uh-huh. cooker fills with steam. That 212 boiling point no it's longer is 212. That'll raise higher. to 280, okay. 290, 300, okay. depending on the amount of pressure yeah. in there. So I didn't getting, think there yeah, was any getting, bacteria that would live past 212. Wow. Oh, you would be surprised because you have raw meat. You have a raw item that natural. Okay, so that meat's naturally going to have some form of germ in it, anyways, right? Some strand of of something in there that that you have to kill in order to do it. Like when you cook and you're cooking pork, for example, you want pork to cook at a certain degree, so you know that that meat is clean after that. Right. Okay. So basically, preserving it in a jar does the same thing. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, that's that's something I've never messed with because my wife does a can and. <laughs> So, <laughs> okay. So I, I've got to ask you. I mean, one of the other things that came to mind is we have an audience of self-reliant individuals. Um, some people would say they're preppers. So, uh-huh. as a prepper, we want to be able to can and do these things in what we would call a grid-down scenario. So, if we've got uh-huh. no electric, um, uh, uh, no stove top. Is uh-huh. Rebel, I mean, can you use like a wood burning stove or open you know, fire, that's, open fire that's, to do that's, this? <laughs> so that's, that's why I guess I, I, yeah. So, okay. 
So this is where this is where it basically boils down to is, is that are you prepared for what happens if, right? The worst case scenario if. I mean, it, honestly, if you ask my husband and I if we were preppers, I, I don't think we can answer yes to that. I I literally address myself as a preparationist. I prepare myself for worst case scenario and I you know, if to educate myself in knowing what's gonna happen. So that's why I say I'm a fence sitter. To me, in order to take care of my family, I have to know what the traditional old world values of how to do something is. Right? Mm-hmm. If I don't, then I'm not gonna be able to preserve food or I'm not gonna be able to take care of my family in a, a natural disaster and I needed to do it. So, so to preserve something in a traditional method, yes, you would have to have that heat on a consistent level, right? And your water has to boil consistently. So over canning, for example, green beans, and if you look at all the Amish recipe books for canning and preserving, it literally says that you are doing it for three hours on a hard boil. So not one time can that fire even slightly reduce in heat. So you want a hard boil for three hours for green beans. Hmm. Yeah, a hard boil is a bunch of bubbles, right? Yes. A like raging a, like a hard rolling, boil, bunch like... of bunch. Yeah. Rolling, raging. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. So, so if you want, I mean, honestly, I think everybody needs to go out there and grab an Amish <laughs> canning book. Oh, I was, I thought you were going to say an Amish person. I'm like, yeah, we'll invite them <laughs> no, over. <laughs> if I had an Amish neighbor, I'd be ecstatic. But realistically, yeah. If you are a prepper and you are trying to prepare yourself for, you know, a situation or a worst case scenario, having an Amish um, canning book is probably one of the best things to throw in your emergency evacuation bucket. I, I just That's had this vision of a little Am- Amish dude just stuffed <laughs> in your bug out bag. <laughs> all right, all right, uh, Amish, what a what, what do we need to do here? Let me let me apologize now to all the Amish people that are listening to this uh, this radio broadcast over the internet. <laughs> I don't think Amish can listen to podcasts, so we're okay. Hey, they used to borrow my aunt's car, so they do stuff. <laughs> Oh my dear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those times when somebody else is going to be offended for them. Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Well, apparently we've probably pissed off a lot of the canning community now anyway. Well, at least right? half yeah, of them. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> at this point. Well, actually, maybe not because I, you know, I will say this though is, is that the question that is thrown back and forth on the canning pages is this. You know, basically back to the the individuals who only do government approved recipes and methods is, what do you do if your power's out? What what do you do? You know, what would happen? And the the response back is, you know, when is that ever going to happen? <laughs> so you know, it's it's a it, it's a really yeah, it's a very very different world. It really is. Well, that's you know, when is that ever going to happen? I love that line because I can go, oh, I don't know, a few years ago, Sandy, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, a few years before that, Katrina, it, it doesn't have to be an right. apocalyptic event. It just has to be right. long enough that, I mean, I, they're still suffering from rolling blackouts in the sandy area. They, that well, grid is, know, the grid is still screwed up there. Exactly. And this is, even for us, we live on the side of a mountain, um, where it, the we, side of the mountain comes directly into the valley. Once that winter's wind hits in, it swirls, it knocks down trees, it knocks down our power. We're without power for a good couple of days. So all I do is go into our pantry. I'll pull out a full meal out of my pantry, reheat on our stove top, on our, um, you know, our wood burning stove top, and we're set. We don't have to worry. I have soup, meat, stews, everything. And that, that's the main reason of being able to preserve your food like that. So you could eat it right out of the jar. Exactly. Exactly. Everything is 100% ready for us. I do. I leave um, from the end of summer. I start my my soup canning, and we put up soups and meat. Um, and so we're prepared. And honestly, it's not just for the days that the power is out. If I'm busy and I have an activity, you know, I can my husband can open a jar and heat it up entirely for my family as well too. So the food is just her there husband for is more talented situation. than me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, know how there. to do it's stuff. <laughs> That is so cool. Now, a minute ago, you said you didn't call yourself a prepper. 
but you called yourself a preparationist. A prep- I love that. Okay. Preparationist. <laughs> because we're always saying, you know, prepper, uh, the name prepper has like these negative things around it. Exactly. But, you know, exactly. we believe in, in growing your own food. Mm-hmm. And part of that is preserving your own food and mm-hmm. preparing for the day when you may not have what you need, uh, whether it be a, a loss of a job, a loss of power uh-huh. in your area, exactly. a winter storm comes through. So I, I, I like that. I might have to steal that. Preparation. Yeah, don't take it. <laughs> it's not patented. It's not trademarked. You can have it. <laughs> you can't. Don't say it too fast though, because it be it would turn into preparation H. Oh, no. <laughs> sorry. That is true too. <laughs> there you go there. So now, uh, just glazing, glazing, uh, grazing. Yeah, gla- <laughs> gazing. That's the word. Gazing at your Facebook page. You you moved from the five acres to a smaller parcel. Is that correct? We did. We did. Um, there was a lot, there was a lot on the five, five acres was over consumed basically by blackberries. The individual that had owned the property, um, consumed not by it, blackberries. So was, by blackberries. We were being paved <sighs> in by blackberries on um, the horse pasture, on um, the old coops in the back of the house, the well house, the barn was completely taken over. And then in addition to that, the in- in- interior of the house completely needed to be remodeled. Um, it, it became, it became an emotional struggle with us. And, um, we in the end were not happy there. So, um, we had, you know, we were raising kids. We were far away that we were still commuting back into the city to give them a better education at a better school district. And it was just, it was just so much weight on our shoulders. You know, we ended up buying two acres of completely untouched land. The home itself doesn't need any work on the inside of it. We are doing a bathroom remodel here coming up in um, next month. But we can actually focus on the exterior and on creating completely untouched land and making a single-family home into a fully self-sustaining homestead. And that is literally homesteading, making the land. It's literally homesteading to the wow. point where um, we're hoping to drop enough trees to add solar paneling you know, to our roofing system. Um, we have, um, we have an oil furnace, but oil is too expensive. So we've resorted into using our wood burning fireplace as our main mm. source of heat. Look, um, look at you know, a, a, a pellet stove or a wood burning stove too. My, my dad just put one in, in his house. Oh yeah. And he said one log is too hot in the morning and just right in the evening. So exactly. So we have a wood burning stove that I cannot see the fire, which really kills me. <laughs> and its main job is to heat the entire house. And it took me almost three months to get used to not being able to see a fire. <laughs> but come last efficient. year in March, I I loved it. You know, it, it was what was needed. <laughs> so where where are you located? Yeah, we never got the location. We are, we are actually twenty five minutes outside of Seattle on the I ninety corridor. And um, we are right at the beginning of farm country, and um, right after us, it hits the mountain passes before you hit eastern Washington. Gotcha. I know exactly where you are. Yep. So I will yeah. tell you, there is a gentleman up in Spokane area that sells gasifying units. That's right. Where you can take your ga- your wood or any other biomass, really, and we're, we use rabbit compressed rabbit pellets. Um and actually burn that as part of your generator to to run any kind of pump that you would want, including an alternator. It, to produce it creates power. electricity. Yeah, sorry, it creates wow. electricity. Wow! Um, and then the it exa- its exhaust is heat. Yeah, it doesn't exhaust. Okay, this is my husband no, would be very interested in talking to you guys for that. <laughs> yeah, where, what's his name? Oh my his gosh, I can't. It's it's um. The, oh, oh my husband. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I want, I want to yeah, know what's your husband's, husband's name, name too? My husband's not? name is Justin. <laughs> Justin. All right, Justin. Well, we'll I, I believe well, – we'll, we need to just figure out which podcast it was that we – Yeah, it was called Gasification. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> the I, I can't remember the, the name of the guy though, but uh, – Yeah, so he's right up there in, in Spokane. So probably a <laughs> three-hour drive from you guys would be my guess yeah. through yeah. the mountains yep. there. So, But yeah, I yep. mean that, the, yep. the, the unit is pretty slick. It – I, I guess you've probably not. I don't, have you heard of gasification before, or is that? I have not. I'm sure my husband. He's responsible for that section of the whole homestead, so yeah. I'm sure that he has. 
<laughs> well, and, and along with the solar and the wood that I would assume you guys have in your area, we do. it's a great yeah. kind of way of, of doing things when the solar is covered up by snow for a week. You know, you can go ahead and, and mm-hmm. run this to, to provide the other electricity. So, so uh, did you come from farming? Because I see the pictures no. of the chickens and all that. Tell me how you no. made this journey no. to homesteading. No, uh, I am a military brat. My father served 21 years in the U.S. Army. Um, and, uh, we, you know, my, my mom and my dad are, their jaws are still dropped. Um, every time they talk to me, they're, they're trying to figure out where and which direction I, I came from. Um, this, we started this journey, um, gosh, going on three years now, three years. And, um, we started off with, um, moving to the Fall City house. And I said, well, there's a chicken coop. Let's get some chickens. <laughs> and, um, I started, I'm an avid researcher, so I just started researching chicken keeping. And then, um, when we decided to leave that place and come here, I, you know, we had, we had our, our garden there, of course, in the Fall City house. And then everything just kind of just started to lay out. The canning's been two years now. So it was chicken and canning first. And then, um, and then the, the goats and the ducks came as we came here. We wanted the goats to clear the land. And so they're actually, because we're tiered and we're on the mountain, um, the goats are clearing the bottom lot where the barn is going to be. And um, so they're working on clearing that out. Um, we don't do any pesticides to um, kill the blackberries because the chickens eventually will free range. We'll have meat um, meat birds down there, the Cornish crosses down there to um, be um, raised for um, meat birds. Eventually, we'll do um, meat rabbit as, as well. Hey, I know um, a guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know a guy too. <laughs> yeah. But my website's thehostelhair.com, so or hostelhair.com. Oh, I, I'm just, I think I'm gonna have to touch bases with you guys after this and then get some information from you. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. And, then the, and then the bees. The bees will come. Um, hopefully, um, I don't think they're honestly gonna come this summer. We have to. Um, there's a lot of land to be cleared with the barn going up. That hopefully the bees will come the following summer, and um, and like I said, there's a lot. There's we're we're surrounded by trees, and we're we're constantly battling that. So we're dropping trees and dropping trees and dropping trees, and um, just trying to get enough sunlight here to be able to utilize and maximize our garden beds. I love it. Well, you know, there's another thing called aquaponics that you should put on that list. Yes. Yes. So, and, uh, I, I happen to know a guy. What I want to do is so big. <laughs> that I just have to like kind of like rein myself in before I get too much project going on. <laughs> well, and, and keep listening to the show because we had, you know, we did a show about Cooney Coons and I can see oh, Cooney Cooney Coonies, Cooney Coonies, the, the pigs, mm-hmm. um, you know, they, they can I be multi I saw that as I found. Yep. yep. Well, the pigs, yeah, the, we're hoping that with the barn going up this, um, this summer, we'll be able to add um, at least two meat pigs, hopefully, hopefully by spring. If, if not, then I, you know, I have no hesitation in putting, pushing the meat pigs back off until the following summer. Well, it sounds to yeah. me like you're going to have a lot to blog about over the next few years. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and I'm so jealous. It sounds beautiful up there. And that just, if I just had an acre, I'm on, I've got 2,500 square feet in my backyard. That's all I've got. Oh. I could do so much activities with with an acre or two. I keep telling him that, you know, the Washington area is a good place to have a family and and move up there. And it's a very pretty place. So it really is. It really is. We just, we're hitting our rainy season now because we're more, you know, because we're on the west side of the mountains, we receive more rain than we do snow. So you have to be able to survive through the rain. And, you know, lots of people are already dropping their garlic. And I'm looking at my, my, you know, my calendar going, no, nah, I have two more weeks. I have two more weeks to drop garlic. I'm not dropping any garlic right now. Absolutely. Well, you know, um, and I want to thank you so much for coming on, educating us on this whole battle about canning that I had no clue even existed. So, <laughs> and you know, like I said, it just sounds like you are a farm girl in the making. So I love the title too. Yeah. Watch thank out you. for those, the crips and the bloods of canning. <laughs> this is wild. <laughs> Oh man. Well, Anne, again, thank you so much. And, uh, we we'll look forward to touching base with you here in the future. See what projects you've got on the docket. Awesome. Okay. Great. Hey, thank you. W- once again, Thanks. you can be reached at, uh, is it www.afarmgirlinthemaking.com? Yeah. Yep. That's, that's it. <laughs> yep. And on wow. Facebook at facebook.com slash a farm girl in the making, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Ann. Thanks, Ann. Have a good one. Things just got real. The drugstore is closed and the doctor is unavailable. What are you going to do? Stock your medicine cabinet and bug out bag with nature's alternative, essential oils. Visit mylavenderlife.com for all your essential oil needs. And that is a great (laughs) interview. (laughs) Seriously, I had no idea that there was such animosity towards each other in these two different groups and canning. I know. And she made it so fun too. <laughs> yeah, she's all, oh, it's so nice. Da, 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 da. But, oh, wow. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know which side I have allegiance to. I know. Uh, well. Is it Team Edward or Team Jacob? Uh, well, I'm, uh, <laughs> in this case, Team Justin. I think that was her team husband's Justin. name. <laughs> so I, I think that my allegiance is to the people who say F the government. Am I allowed to say that on air? (laughs) How about just no allegiance? You do what you think is best for your family and not worry about it. And if it smells bad, throw it away. There you go. Um, Not when it comes to children. If it smells bad and it's your child, give them a bath. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, where are you going with it? Don, Don, you're going to say feed it to him. If it smells bad, just have your kid try it. If he doesn't get sick and die, you're good. Now, on a serious note, botulism is a bad thing. I mean, you die from that. And canning is something that you do have to be careful with. So don't just go out, throw a bunch of meat in a jar and stick it in a pressure cooker. It's a lot more serious than that. Whether you're doing it, and I think everybody should know how to, Mm -hmm. including me. Mm -hmm. Um, But don't just go stick meat in there and and boil it for a while and think it's going to be safe because – 25 years later, it's not. And that's that's something that I just assume that once something hits boiling temperature for a long period of time, you're good. Yeah. Now, you you guys can. Your wife can. Yeah. Well, okay. She's, her and her mom get together and uh, what are you laughing at? <laughs> what are you, I, I was almost going to – Did you fart make, and get away with it? What is this? I was going to make a comment and it just sounded wrong in my head, so I caught myself <laughs> There's probably a lot of things that go wrong in your head. Yeah, but I caught it this time. But I just <laughs> – Yeah, you didn't – no. No, you didn't catch yourself. So what were you saying? I don't know. So my wife and my mother-in-law, they can stuff and they're always putting green beans and stuff in jars and doing all that. And I'd never taken an interest in it because me, Hunter, me, bring me to home. You know, that's – Kind of my my role is I I produce the meat. Typical male chauvinist. Not a chauvinist. <laughs> just a that's what I do. That uh, I mean I I guess it's my turn to learn that trade since I made Cherie cut and gut a rabbit on yeah, national huh? so TV. Now you should be able to can. <laughs> now when, does she use a pressure cooker? Yes. So do you guys can meat as well? Yes. Well I. Yeah, they've got canned deer meat in there and stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Yep. In fact, uh, my wife's favorite thing to tell people is she's eaten peaches from the year she was born, like last year. So, really? yeah. And uh, her, uh, her grandparents, the Johnsons, they live in Utah and, uh, they've got, um, they're, they're real big into canning and stuff and they always come down with a truckload of canned goods that they did themselves. So the, there, are they LDS as yes. well? Okay. Yeah. And, and LDS, Mormons. Uh huh. I mean, seem to have this thing about canning. Yeah. I'm not well, trying to offend anybody, but it seems to be. It's part very of offensive, the culture. Don. It's very offensive. I we're know. It we're seems canners. To be part of the culture. Why are you so stereotypical that all Mormons are canners? <laughs> like you, you bringing home the bacon, right? That's right. <laughs> no, well, my mom was actually a, a, a steak canning specialist. Steak as in a, a group of wards that's a, okay. We're going to get into the hierarchy of the church here. Uh, Basically, she was over a group of people to teach them how to can. And yeah, the LDS church has been into that for a long time. So the reason I was bringing that up is Mm -hmm. because don't they also put on classes on how to can? Yes. At a lot of churches? Yes. Okay. So, and I don't think you need to be a member in order to go do that. So that may be a resource for people wanting to learn Mm -hmm. other than books, which it's, you know, I'm the kind of guy I'll read a book and yeah, I can go do it. You but know I, how to read? I do, but I'd rather go actually do something and see how it's done mm-hmm. and feel how it's done and, you know, kind of learn that way. It's a little bit easier for me. So Yeah, hands-on is always – if nothing else, it's more fun. Heck so, yeah. Heck yeah. Um, and what's cool is on – in in 
Oh, is it Mesa or Tempe? Right there on the cusp of Mesa Tempe area is the, is the LDS cannery. And you can go down there and can cocoa and all kinds of stuff. And like the number 10, the number 10 cans. Yeah. So in actual can cans, not oh, just yeah. mason jars. Oh yeah. Cause I think of canning, I think mason jars. Uh huh. So, so I gotta ask you, what you, you said your grandparents can? Her grandparents. Her do. grandparents and, and they do. Where do you guys get your foods? Well, um, there's places you can buy chicken in bulk. Uh, I think it's like 75 cents to 80 cents a pound for if you're buying 30 to 40 pounds of chicken. And is that kind of the way that you guys do it is you go out and buy a bunch of food That's, and can it all? We have done it that way. Uh, there's this market on the move. They call it the yeah, mom. The mom. And my wife, she, <laughs> it was like 10 bucks for a trailer load of. Yeah, you get like a laundry basket full. Yeah. And she just filled up to, she spent 60 bucks and our kitchen table was mounds of green stuff. And, you know, I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy, you know, and I'm looking at all the green stuff thinking, great. But she, her and her mom, they, they busted out the canner and, and away they went. And, uh, what they didn't see as fit to go into cans, I took home and fed to the livestock. So, yeah. uh, 10 bucks for like 60 pounds is what it ended up being. Wow. So 60 pounds, 10 bucks, that's, you can't buy a bag of rabbit feed for that. So no, I don't think you can. You can't. I don't think you buy alpalpa, 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 alfalfa pellets for that. That's cool. So I guess that, that's a. And then apparently the Amish, if you're yes in an Amish community or area, yeah. I don't know if they put on classes or anything like the LDS churches I think do. But if you Amish are very barter, you know they they do a lot of barter and stuff. Uh, in my hometown, Bloomington, Wisconsin. Um, there's a, not a huge Amish population, but there are a few there. Nice, nice people. And they do come over and they'll use the phone and stuff. It's like, don't you guys have a phone? Oh, you, okay. Come on in. <laughs> and, uh, the last time one of the guys, I forget his name, but he came over. I was like, dude, that is an epic beard. He's like, everybody in the English tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because it's awesome. Anyway, um, but uh, they're they're pretty they're pretty keen on 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 not being nice and friendly. So well, they need to preserve food because exactly. they don't have the electricity to exactly. You know, so I guess they're rebel canners. So we Heck know what yeah. side they fall on. Well, they don't pay taxes either. So <laughs> I, honestly, I think the Amish have got it right. That's that's the way the Mormons should have went. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This up on the technology thing. I say we go back to it. Ah, uh, I don't know. I like the <laughs> technology a little bit. Uh-huh. Now there's some benefits to it. But. There is, and I you're, you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You're giving that stuff up. But anyway, Amish people know how to can. If you know some, use them. And Mormons. And Mormons. All right, cool. So <laughs> we've pissed off the rebel canners, the Amish, and the Mormons. Now we're on a roll. No, no, no. All you have to do to bring the Mormons back on your side is tell people to go to the church, and they're like, "Oh, yeah, missionary work." <laughs> <laughs> so they may try to convert you, but that's cool. It's a good message. There you go. <laughs> All right, so we're going to end with our webpage, wegrowours.com. If you want to ask questions, it's wegrowours.com slash ask us. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash wegrowours and Twitter at twitter.com slash wegrowours. Thank you to our show sponsors, hostelhair.com and – My Lavender. Yeah, but she changed her website. Oh, gosh dang it. You can still go to mylavenderlife.com or Pure and Natural Simple. Pure, Which one do you like natural better? Natural and simple. No, just pure natural simple. Really? Yeah. I don't know. That sounds pretty cool too. Yeah. Either one will get you there. So she does the oils for essential oils and ecopod gardens and we do aquaponic design and consulting. So if you have any questions on that, please stop by. Next week we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, – I was hoping to do it this week but I couldn't get it done quick enough. We were out at the Prepper Fest. Yes. And one of the things that came, we got some really good guests lined up. Oh, yeah. So we're going to have fun with us. So we got some people on Bitcoins and self defense. Blooming good time. And medical and yes, alcohol. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, really looking forward to that. And we found a charity out there that gives rides to vets. Yep. And this will be the shout of the week, we'll say. Yeah, our our small business shout out. Well, we're going to do it for a charity for the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, This gentleman had a great story. He was actually just driving down the road, saw a homeless vet who had a little sign that said, I need a ride to the VA. So he gave him a ride. And I'm going to let him come on and tell this. But 
it, this has turned into this huge charity thing. And this is VA in Phoenix, but yeah. the VA here has all these vans sitting out back and they don't use them. And you get all these homeless people across the, the state who can't afford a bus ticket, let alone a taxi. Mm-hmm. And basically he goes out and picks these guys up and brings them to the VA. And then he'll pick them up when they're done and drive them home. And he's looking for help and support in that, whether it be driving or whether it be monetary or, you know, anything else. So we're going to try and support that. So check out the show notes for some more information on him. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try and get him on the podcast here and kind of tell his story. So thanks. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll catch you next week.